How many of you have read the book of Acts? Just by a show of hands. May have been a while, but somewhere along the way you read the book of Acts. It's a wonderful book. One thing that I've noticed about the Bible in general is that some parts of it are a little easier to grab onto. All of the Bible, I want to make this statement just so we're not misunderstanding, all of the Bible is 100% applicable to you and to me today. All right? It's as, it's as valid, it's as important, it's as useful as it was the day the ink was wet on the page. But that being said, some parts of it, because of the culture it was written in and the time and the circumstance, takes a little bit more effort to, to grab onto it for yourselves today. The book of Acts, because of where the missionaries were working, I think is a little closer to us. Think about it this way. The first half of Acts is really about Peter and John, and the second half is more about the Apostle Paul and the early missionaries. But they were operating, and so was Jesus for that matter in the New Testament. They were operating in an area of the world that was part of the Roman Empire. I don't know if you've ever sat back and thought about this, but we are still greatly impacted by the Roman Empire even in the 21st century. So much of our culture, so much of our architecture, our alphabet, the words we use, and just our, our, our general cultural mindset was formed in that Greco-Roman period in the late B.C.s and early A.D.s. And so it doesn't take quite as much of a jump sometimes for us to grasp what is being taught in those areas of the Scriptures. I don't think it's an accident. that I know it's not. That Jesus came to the earth when Jesus came to this earth. God needed him to be there right then. And I think the fact that he was able to, to teach and to preach and to lead and start the church in that Roman period that would continue even into our very day and probably until the day that he returns has an impact on our culture was no accident. And it really does make it easier for us to grab onto it at times. With that in mind, I'd like to take you to this chapter in Acts that I have admired for years and years, but as I was looking back over the notes of when I've preached and what I've preached and taught, I've never preached this passage before. So this is new to me and new to you. We're going to be in the book of Acts chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, whether it's in a book form or in a tablet or a phone, I would encourage you to, uh, to turn there with me to Acts chapter 17. Now we're going to really focus today on verses 30 and 31, but I would not do it justice if we didn't do a little bit more than that. So that'll be our focal passage, verses 30 and 31. But I'm going to give you some lead up to it. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is known as Paul on Mars Hill, or the Areopagus, depending on how you want to look at it. And my sermon title for today is very simply, A Sermon for Today. I believe that this passage is probably in all the Bible, maybe the closest to where we need to be in our daily walk, our daily ministry, our daily message to a lost and dying world. Because whether you know it or not, we live with a lot of Romans around us all the time. I'll explain that as we go along. But let me give you a little bit of context so you understand what's going on. This was during what is known as Paul's third missionary journey. If you're not familiar with the Apostle Paul, he was a, a, a Jewish leader, a learned man, and he was in the process of going out and trying to crush the early church when Jesus appeared to him on the road to a city called Damascus. He was transformed radically. He went from being a persecutor of a church to being the greatest missionary that maybe the world has ever seen. Not long after that, he became associated with the church in Antioch and uh, through a man named Barnabas, and the church sent him out on a missionary journey, the two, the two men along with a, a young man named John Mark. And there's a whole lot more to that, but I'll just leave it at that point for now. And, and they kind of went in the general environs around where they were in, in, in what is really southern Turkey today. They came back. They regrouped, they went out again, and that time they expanded and went into Europe and Greece. And they went around and founded some churches and met some, some people and, and really started doing amazing work. And then the third missionary journey took them back over that same territory again, and he just dug deeper that time and spent more time in some of the major metropolitan areas of that area. While they were on that third missionary journey, they were being dogged. Right behind them, just chewing at their heels as they went along were their opponents who said, this guy is no good, 
don't listen to him. You need to throw him out of your town. And people were doing that on a regular basis, by the way. And, and this is what led Paul to uh, leave the city called Berea and go to kind of under the darkness of night. His traveling companion sent him on to a city called Athens. Have you guys heard of Athens, Greece? You should. It's still around. Uh, Athens had been a major hub of culture a few hundred years earlier. This is where classical Greek came into being, the art, the philosophy, the government, many of the things that the Romans then ripped off, rebranded for their own, and then kind of got to us again today in our modern day. But by the time we had gotten to Paul's day in the early first century, Athens was really a shadow of its former self. It was a small town by then, maybe 10,000 residents. A lot of them were philosophers and painters and navel gazers of all sorts. They still had all the beautiful buildings and they had all the beautiful art and all of that. And so it was a tourist area, not unlike Kailo Kona, Hawaii. And so, but even though it had lost its former luster, there was still that sense within Athens, in Greece as a whole, that philosophy was king. And so Luke shares with us, in the run-up to the sermon, that the Athenians were all about learning what the new thing was. Does that sound like America in the 21st century? Guys, we used to call it a fad back in the day, remember? And sometimes fads would hang around for a while. But it seems like today, you just about grasp what the new thing is, and then they're on to the next. We've had some crazy fads over the year. I was thinking about that today. Um, did we just lose me? We okay? Okay, sorry. Just me. I was thinking about some of the, pardon me? Okay, we, we had some silly fads in our times, right? We grew up with a pet rock. You guys remember that? I wish I could think of one thing like that. Dance crazes, right? The Macarena, remember that? I mean, you see that in sports stadiums and whatever. And I actually know how to do that, but that will not be shown today. Sorry, I'm here to glorify God. <laughs> Negative. We'll do that later. Some other time. So I promise. Yeah, I'll have to go watch the video on YouTube to make sure I do remember that. But, you know, it just goes fast and furious. And, and, and in our world today, it is literally what is the new thing today? And so we should kind of grasp what the situation was in Athens in the first century. The Apostle Paul, as he would always do, came into town and he started preaching in the synagogues. And then during the week, he was out in the Agora the marketplace, talking to people, reasoning with people. And, and I think that maybe his, his, his method was a little more intense because Luke shares that when Paul hit town and he looked around, it, those beautiful buildings weren't just beautiful buildings. They were temples to foreign gods. Those statues weren't just statues. They were statues of pagan deities. And, and Luke shares that, that Paul was literally, he was angered in his spirit. He was hacked off. Here you got this man who was raised in a Jewish family and believed there's only one God. Then he became a follower of Jesus Christ. And he said, not only is there one God, he is the person of Jesus Christ. And then he comes into this city where everywhere you look, there's some tin God being represented by some beautiful statue. And he was jacked up. And so as he went into the Agora every day, there was a certain intensity about the way that he was discussing this with people. But the philosophers, the cultured philosophers of the day, speaking in low tones and wearing their very learned garb, didn't like Paul very much. Some translations, they refer to him as a babbler. But the word behind that is actually a very unkind phrase. They refer to him as a seed picker. He was the kind of guy they thought it was going around and taking a little bit from this philosopher and a little bit from that philosopher and a little bit from this guy over here and maybe something read on the back of a cereal box and he's putting it together and making it his own. It's just so much junk. You know, that's what the world does today, folks. We see a lot of that out here. The, Bi the Bible scholars use a very sophisticated term. It's called syncretism. And that's the idea where you take a little bit from buddha and you take a little bit from new age and you take a little bit from oprah and you cobble it all together y'all are laughing but you know people do it you have friends and neighbors who do that and they make it their own more about that in just a moment they didn't like paul very much 
And so they said, we need to find out more about what you're about to find out whether you're dangerous, whether or not we need to maybe send you out of town. And so they took him to the Areopagus, to Mars Hill. This is a place where there were hearings. We don't know how formal it was. Was it something where Paul could have been tried for a crime? We don't think so. But there is a sense from the scholars that what he went there for was they wanted to find out whether or not he fit into their culture. And if they didn't like what he had to say, they're going to say, Paul, we'll escort you to the boundary of town and send him packing. And so that's how Paul ends up at this place with all these philosophers. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention two sets of philosophers here because Luke mentions them. They were the Epicureans and the Stoics. And they're about as far from each other as you possibly could be. Stoics were the ones who believed that life was about rationality. Life was about order. Life was about honor and how you conducted yourself in life. They did have a sense of something greater than themselves, but they certainly were not Christian in any form or fashion. The opposite end of the spectrum were the Epicureans. The Epicureans really didn't believe in any kind of God at all, that basically their existence was here, and then you're poof and you're gone. And so they thought, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we will be dead. And those are the two groups of individuals, generally speaking, who were with Paul on Mars Hill. And so with that background, we come to this sermon. And, and if it's okay with you, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to kind of step through this a little bit and stop and pause and give you a little commentary down through this until we get to the core passage where the bang comes in, okay? So if you will, starting in verse 22 of chapter 17 of Acts, Luke, the doctor, writes, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Now understand, if, if you were one that were, was steeped in the rhetoric of that time, they loved public speakers. And lots of times it was more about how you spoke than what you actually said. Reminiscent of our world today again, I think, at times. Because I dare say there are people that get a lot more influence than they probably should if people listen to the content of the message instead of the slickness on the surface. But this is how you would gain favor with your listeners by complimenting them here's the amazing thing about it he uses the word religious there and i think religious then and religious now kind of means the same thing because if you tell me i'm religious i'm somewhat insulted in this world today because you understand that this word not just meant religious like we think about it but it also had the sense of superstitious and so he really pitched a loaded term at these folks as he started this message off. You're religious, but what is your religion all about? And then he mentions this unknown God. And, and I said earlier that we'd get back to the seed picker idea. Isn't that a lot of what the world presents today? I'm not sure about that religion. That one seems to have something that might work. So I'll grab that. And I'll grab that and I'll grab the other and I'll cobble together the system. But really what I'm trying to do is set up some sort of bumper system around me to protect me that no matter what happens, I'm covered. I've got a fallback position no matter what. Because just in case I'm wrong, I want to have something back there that's going to keep me from whatever that is. I'm not sure. And so... This is, seems to be what was going on in Greece is they had all their pantheon of gods. And if you've studied any of that, you know all those guys. They lived in Olympus and they were a, they were a mess, weren't they? they? They were arbitrary as all get out. They, they'd just smite somebody because they didn't like the way they wore their hair. They'd sleep with humans and have demigod, half human, half gods. You guys read all that stuff? I mean, it's ridiculous, right? People still like that today, unfortunately. They seem to like that kind of thing. But yet they have this unknown God. Just in case we're wrong about Olympus. Just in case we're wrong about Zeus and Apollo and Hermes. Just in case we're wrong. He's the fallback God. He's the one that's going to keep me from being pulverized. I would say burning in hell, but I don't think they had that idea. Yeah, Hades, I don't know. But in anyway. So he says... You guys are superstitious, and you got the fallback God. Now it's time to talk about that. 
Because listen to the next verse, the next part of the verse. 23, second part. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. In other words, all this other stuff you've got is junk. I don't mean to offend, but it's junk. I want to talk to you about the true God. And then he launches into the sermon in whole. Let me let's read this next part. This leads up to the focal passage. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being as also one of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and men's devising. I come from a part of the country where, and, and, and I'm being somewhat facetious and a little bit hyperbolic in what I'm saying, everybody was a Christian. I grew up in the South. Everybody was a Christian. You are either Baptist or Methodist, kind of what we had. Right? Maybe Pentecostals, a few around. And everybody was a Christian. Everybody went to church. Everybody grew up in the church. Everybody knew the pastor's name. Now, the truth is, a lot of people weren't Christians. But they had the cultural understanding of that. But when I would go, if I went and knocked on somebody's door, and they came to the door, and I started talking to them about Jesus Christ, I didn't have to start way back. I started with, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about you. And let's talk about how you and Jesus can get together. Right. I mean, that was that was the message. Right. And there's a lot more to that. And I'll get there in a minute or two as well. Today, that's not the case. You don't believe me? Go read the Internet. I was just I don't know why I was looking for this the other day. I'm, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to science stuff. I always have been. I'm, I'm 58 years old. So I grew up in a time when they were shooting guys to the moon and you, know, you got it. Everybody wanted to be an astronaut and. You know, I, I just didn't like math and I'm nearsighted, so I blew that off. But <laughs> nonetheless, that kind of kind of shot that unless I was payload. I wasn't going to the moon. And so um, but but I'm kind of a nerd about planets and things like that. And, and living here with the with just the, the, the way we live here, um, nature is so in your face lots of times. And so I was sitting on my front lawn the other morning before sunrise. And, and I just had the sense, OK, now, which way does the earth rotate? And which, day, which way does it revolve? Okay, this is nerd stuff, right? Don't go to sleep on me. I'm going to stop right there. I'll keep moving. But, but, but I, so I started looking it up. And guys, I, I, I stumbled across this website sitting on my front lanai at 530 in the morning with this person explaining why the earth rotates from west to east. And it was the biggest hunk of malarkey. Is that a bad word? That I'd ever read. He's talking about, whoa, back when the earth was just a swirling bunch of dust and then other dust came in and it lumped together and because it was flying by, it started to spin and over time. And then you get, oh. And anybody that knows me, when you get into this, I just, my eyes roll back in my head and I'm like, oh, give me a break. And, 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 and it's, it's, I, I read it for about three paragraphs, and I thought, I'll never get that time back, ever. <laughs> I just lost that forever, right? <laughs> you just want to get into comments and say, dude, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> One sentence. We're done. So I was highly dissatisfied. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm, I'm still amazed, by the way. I mean, you just think that God, in His infinite wisdom, created all of this with a thought. And all these mechanisms, all these well-educated people come up with, it's beyond them. And their craziest ideas, right? 
Well, the reason that there was a great die-off many millions of years ago was because of a meteor that hit just beside the Yucatan Peninsula and killed all the dinosaurs. No, it was a flood where God saved eight people and an ark full of animals. That's what destroyed everything. Much learning has made these people crazy. I just got to say that. I'm sorry, I'm starting to vent. Let me get back to the message. The point here is, in our world today, in order to be able to talk to people about Jesus, lots of times we've got to start with God. Because God is not an assumption in our world today. He just, I don't believe in your God. He believes in you. Guaranteed. But maybe it's always been that way and we just didn't realize it. We make a lot of assumptions sometimes in our lives. I make an assumption everybody thinks the same way I do. And I know that's my wife doesn't even think the same way I do. <laughs> about some things thank God <laughs> keeps us from going off in the ditch sometimes that's what Paul had to do he had to start with this is the God of the universe the creator the perfect and holy and righteous and just and all-knowing and all-powerful and ever-present always God of the universe that's where he had to start to bring them back around. And that's what he was doing. And that was the point that he was trying to make in this passage. He says, he's made everybody. We're all of the same blood. We all came from the same source. A guy named Adam. Right? The world wants to tell you that's not right either. right? And, and, and you and I are all the product of some accident and some pile of ooze somewhere that got hit by a lightning bolt and all of a sudden it started this replication of cells and that your ancestors are not the people that you've got in a book at home in the pictures, but some toad and some fish and some monkey that got to you. I think it takes more belief. I think it takes more faith to believe in that than it does in this. I honestly do. If I have irritated you at this point, please tell me afterwards. I'd love to have that conversation, by the way. And I'm not trying to be arrogant or jerk about the whole thing. I love having this conversation. Um, because the world sure has tried to sell us a bill of goods, haven't they? And I think I've got a probably pretty sympathetic crowd here. But if any of you are just going, this guy has lost his mind. I can't get out of here soon enough. Would you hang in here for just another few minutes? And it'll all be worthwhile. I promise. So, you know, he says he's made every, every nation. By the way, he says he, he's not made. He doesn't live in a, in, a, in a temple. He does not made by hands. He is, God is bigger than us. He's greater than us. And he doesn't need you nor me. I'm just so glad that he does use you and I. Isn't that wonderful? But he doesn't need me. I'm always reminded, okay, more geek. I was always reminded of Star Trek V, terrible movie, but the great line where this creature that's supposed to be God tells Captain Kirk that he needs a, a starship. And Captain Kirk, probably the smartest thing he ever said, he goes, excuse me, why does God need a starship? And I thought, boom, that's kind of Christian in its own way. So thank you for that. That was pretty cool. Every so often. But it says not just, not just that he doesn't need to be... Be, he doesn't need us. He makes everybody on the planet, and he says he's appointed our pre-appointed or determined our pre-appointed times and the boundaries of our dwellings. That's talking about two things. It's talking about the nations that have been that the God has ordained to be on this earth, but it's also talking about the seasons and the places where we live. God is in control of everything, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you believe that. None of this is an accident to God. God didn't just spin it out and then just walk away and say, "Catch up with me later." God cares about everything that's going on. He knows about everything that's going on. And when you pray to Him, He's a God that can get it done. Amen. And that's an important aspect because the gods of the Greeks and the Romans didn't really care. Our God does care. If you're here today and your life is a wreck, or maybe it's heading into a wreck, or you're just coming out of a wreck, or maybe it's just perfect today, God cares about all of that stuff. He cares about what you're going through. He cares about the things that you're struggling with, whether it's trying to put a five where a 50 needs to go or you've got some kid that's just absolutely decided they're just going to just blow you off and go do their own thing. Or because the crowd here is like me, we're kind of getting a little longer in years. You're kind of just facing some things like the end of your career or your health or whatever like that. He cares about all of that and he wants to be involved in your life. And this is what Paul is trying to share here. 
But then we see this. This is our focal passage. You say, that took a long time. This is going to be easy. Truly, verse 30, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. You see, here's the problem with philosophy. Here's the problem with the world is that people are going about doing their thing with no thought about what the next life has to offer or what will happen to them. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 9.27 it is appointed to man once to die and then the judgment. That is going to happen to everyone. Now, if you looked at that verse like I did, and I had to really noodle over this this week, and I, I had to pray a lot. It says, wait a minute, these times of ignorance God overlooked. What's, what's God overlooking? Does God overlook sin? Is that what he's saying there? No. Yes and no. The problem with America today, our mindset is we're very individualistic. Would you agree with that? It's all about what I'm going to do. What's required of me? The Bible is written more from a, we're part of a greater whole idea right and so the church not the individual if you will from a new testament perspective even back in the old testament is about the nation of israel not the individual the individual is never greater than the group never greater than the whole and so when he says god overlooked what he's trying to get to is this god punished the earth he flooded the earth and destroyed all living beings that breathed air except for abraham uh, for noah and his family the eight people in the ark plus the animals that they had put on there Destroy the earth. And he said, I won't do this again by flood. But he did promise one day there would come judgment. The entire New Testament points toward that day of judgment. But God has been long-suffering with humanity to leave us here. And I know those of you who are Christians here today say, how can God hang on any longer? Has this world gotten so wicked that it is not time? I've heard people say, if God doesn't punish us, he needs to ask forgiveness of Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't agree with that, but I think it's a catchy little line, right? I mean, this world is messed up in so many ways. And our country just seems like every, talk about every new thing, it seems like almost every day you pick the paper up and you think, I didn't think we could go any deeper into the morass of sin and depravity. And yet deeper we go and deeper we go, right? And yet here's God waiting. And I'm so glad he is. You know why he's waiting, right? God desires that none would perish. The reason he's waiting is because of his mercy and his grace. He's waiting for more people to come into his family. He's waiting for more people to become followers of Jesus Christ. He's waiting for more people to go, this doesn't work. You guys know what I'm talking about? You are Christians. Haven't you had some lost people that are friends and families of yours? I've got one guy in particular I always think of, and, and, and I call him up from time to time, and, he, and, and his life has just become a mess. And, and I'm a good enough friend to this guy that I remember the conversation. It's been a long time ago now. I said, so how's that working for you? Dead air on the phone. Not so good. I have the solution. He's called Jesus. God is waiting because he knows the end. And he's not in a hurry. Aren't we glad of that? I know sometimes you go, God, even so, come quickly. But when he does, the judgment begins in earnest. And if you've read the book of the Revelation, this is not going to be a place to hang out. It's going to be awful. Let's not rush that if we don't have to. All right? We're going to be with God for an eternity, folks, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. So a few more years here is not a problem. Right? You think, I don't know. I don't know if I can stand it. If you can't stand it, imagine how God feels about that. You know what I'm saying? The time is coming. The time is coming. And he says that he is appointed that day and he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he ordained. Jesus is the judge. Why is Jesus the judge? Because Jesus died on the cross for you and me. You see, 
God is holy and perfect and has never made a mistake and has no evil within him. Unfortunately, mankind has all of that. And the Bible calls that sin, falling short of God's perfect standard of sinless holiness. And the Bible says that the punishment for that, the wages of sin, is death. And that doesn't mean just one day you're going to stop breathing and they're going to have a, you know, put you out in the ocean or have a memorial service for you. That's talking about spiritual death, separation from God for an eternity. Because not only does God not want to do with your sin and mine here, He definitely doesn't want it in His heaven. And so when you die, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you're not, your spirit is going to continue to live, but He's not taking you into His place. And the only place left for you is a place that was destined for the punishment of Satan and his imps, a place called hell. And that's where your spirit goes, and it doesn't come back. You're not going to get prayed out of there. You're there forever. All right? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus is God. He took the form, became a human being, came to this earth, lived, taught, gave a life of example, but his mission was to die for you and me. He never sinned, not one time ever in his life. He was the only one that didn't deserve to die. The wages of sin were not in his equation, but he came specifically as a perfect, holy, sinless sacrifice to die for you and me and to take the sin of the world upon himself on a Roman cross, executed unfairly, unjustly, illegally, but not a martyr. He did it willingly. What does Paul say at the very end of this message? He says, He has given assurance to this, to all, by raising Him from the dead. Three days after He died, He was in the grave. He rose again. And He never died again. He is alive today in glory, waiting for all who call upon Him. Now, the, the Stoics and Epicureans didn't like the message. And it says afterwards that when they heard the resurrection of the dead, they mocked him. And some said, we'll hear you more on this. And there was at least one of that group who accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and their, and their Lord. Here's the thing. You're the Stoics and the Epicureans today if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. Today, you have to make the same decision that those men that were on Mars Hill that day had to make. Are you going to accept the message? Are you going to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord? Or are you going to walk away? You have the same choice. Everyone in the world has that same choice. And you can make it today. Paul writes in Romans that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. That means saved from that destiny of hell. It means saved to a relationship with the God of the universe. It means no longer having to cobble together some seed picker pile of garbage. You can know the truth of God's love and God's destiny for you. You can know that today. Folks, this is a message for today. And let me encourage you before we pray. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, yes, you can accept Him as your Lord and Savior today, and I hope you'll do that. We're going to pray that way. If you already are His follower, take a clue from this message. Maybe read back over it yourself and, 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 and draw it into your own spirit because you know people that need this message. People that maybe only you can reach the god has said tag you're it this family member this friend this co-worker this neighbor the stranger in a line at the costco they're yours are you ready what's an amazing thing is i just preached on a message that was 10 verses long this thing probably took three and a half minutes i took a lot longer to spin it out than that but imagine that you could do this message in three minutes at the Costco and in the line, right? I mean, just, just think about that, right? And so I don't want this to just be about if you don't know Jesus, come to know him today. I hope you will. But if you're here today and you know him as your Savior and your Lord, can you use this as a lifeline to throw out to people who need to hear this message today? Let me bow our heads.